Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today um, to hear about recent findings from UCLA and USC researchers that will contribute to moving Los Angeles, our city, toward a more resilient and sustainable city. These research projects were co-developed between academic researchers and practitioners at the LA Department of Water and Power to address challenges along the utilities path in meeting the city's ambitious climate goals. This work occurred through a unique partnership between the UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge and LADWP to bring great minds from across the city to innovate together and accelerate our city's response to the climate crisis. Today, you will learn more about the heat impacts on climate in Los Angeles and about the city's water supply and its resiliency. I'm going to pass it over to Steve Bell, our partner and director of sustainable projects at LADWP. Thanks, Kathy. Um, no, we're really excited to be here. This is really four years in the making. We started this about four years ago, sort of asking the question to the regional academic uh, community here in Los Angeles about how they can help us with the everyday operations of running this utility, particularly the climate challenges that are impacting the city. Now, I think the benefit of this has been remarkable. Um, you, know, you look at also the research that has been done on climate equity, everything from community engagement, employment, green workforce, to even microgrids, and just looking at the general um, transition of the, of the of a clean energy future. And it's a diverse set of topics. So we just have a select set of topics here um, that we will be discussing. So we're really excited about that. And before I hand it over back to Kathy, I just wanted to give a shout out to our LADWP team who has been working on these projects. So that's Teresa Kim who has been working on the LA Aqueduct System, Rafael Villegas, who has been working on the resiliency benefits of the Hyperion, Marianne So for the seismic risk, and then Craig Tranby on the anthropogenic piece. Uh, I should also give a big shout out to Joy Alicone. She has been sort of very instrumental in the organizing these task orders as well as all these research projects. So thank you so much for joining. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, we're just gonna jump right into it. We have a lot of uh, presentations today and we'd like to give all of you some time for Q&A. So we're gonna jump into the first one. I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Kelly Sanders. Um, she's the Dr. Tae Fu Yen, Early Career Chair and an Associate Professor at the University of Southern California's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Her research aims to ease tensions between human and natural systems, with particular emphasis on reducing the environmental impacts of providing energy and water, analyzing tensions between climate change, adaptation, and mitigation strategies, and anticipating the effects of climate change on energy systems. She is especially interested in topics at the intersection of engineering, science, and policy. Today, Dr. Sanders will talk about her research on the impact of heat caused by human activities in the urban canopy on the temperatures in Los Angeles. This work is critical for prioritizing and identifying strategies to reduce temperatures and create a more habitable city. I'm handing it off to you now, Kelly, thanks. Great, thank you, Cassie. Are my slides and audio okay? Everything looks good. Okay, wonderful. So again, my name is uh, Kelly Sanders and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at USC. Um, so I'm gonna be talking to you about this work that we've been doing on anthropogenic heat. And I wanna make sure that I don't take uh, all the credit because there has been a PhD student that's really at the heart of all of this work named Joseph Coe. He's gonna be graduating in December, just as he's finishing up this project. So he's really done the legwork on this project. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, my colleague, George Van Weiss, who was the original PI on this particular project. And unfortunately, I know a lot of you knew him um, and he passed away sadly a year ago. And my uh, dog is, is, is barking as we often get on these virtual. <laughs> Zoom meetings. So as I introduce this idea of anthropogenic heat, I want to talk a little bit about the urban heat island effect more broadly. So heat trapped in cities is a function of the urban materials themselves. Um, so concrete, for example, can hold more heat than, say, grass can. The urban geometry 
um, how that solar radiation, for example, gets heat uh, trapped within the geometry of the city, um, spaces that don't have a lot of green, a lot of trees tend to be warmer than other parts. And then we have this issue of anthropogenic heat, um, which is pretty difficult to quantify because of data shortages. And so that's the part of this urban heat island effect that we've really tried to get into the details with, with this particular project. And just to define this a little bit um, for the audience, we're defining anthropogenic heat as the waste heat that's generated from human activity. And here we're looking at vehicles, buildings, and human metabolism. And I'm gonna step through all three of those contributions during this presentation. Anthropogenic heat can be a significant contributor to the overall um, urban heat island effect, which we're gonna see in this um, presentation. And prior results, for example, this one that I'm setting here, or I'm citing from Tokyo, estimates that this anthropogenic heat component itself can contribute um, temperatures of one to two degrees Celsius compared to a city without any anthropogenic heat. So keep that in mind. So there's two major parts of this project um, that were challenging from a data analysis perspective. In the first part, we are trying to generate a high resolution gridded anthropogenic heat flux data set for Los Angeles County and we're modeling the year 2016. Um, and really the innovation with this particular study is the spatial temporal resolution that we're able to do this with. So we're looking at gridded 100 by 100 meter cells, and we're doing this for hourly increments. So we basically have hourly, uh, a, diurnal set, a diurnal pattern um, representative for each month of the year. Then what we do is we take that anthropogenic heat flux data set and we run it inside of a regional climate model to try to understand how this anthropogenic heat is really impacting our local and regional meteorology. So first I'll be talking about the generation of the heat flux data set and then I'll talk a little bit about the climate simulations which we're working on now. So again, there's three parts of the total anthropogenic heat flux. The first is the buildings part, which I'm going to talk about first. Um, and there's a really key assumption that we assume here, and this is consistent across the scientific literature and you know, the laws of the conservation of energy, but we're really assuming that energy consumption is equal to our anthropogenic heat flux itself. So all of the energy uh, consumed in our buildings, consumed in our cars, and then also consumed by our person. So keep that in mind. And I'm happy to go through that those assumptions and questions if you want me to unpack that a little bit more. So this, the challenge of this project was really harmonizing all of these data sets. So we took um, dozens of data sets from the UCLA Energy Atlas to smart meter data from some of our local utilities um, our electricity utilities, our gas utilities. Um, we used vehicle data from SCAG and LA Metro and uh, Caltrans. And then we also took census level data to try to estimate some of our human metabolism. All of these data sets are on different spatial scales, different temporal scales. And so that was the really challenging part of this was really trying to harmonize all of these different data sets to get them on one grid um, in a very, very high resolution um, data set. So when it came to buildings, we started out with the Energy Atlas. Um, that's been really worked on by some of our colleagues at UCLA. And we tuned that with smart meter data that allowed us to look at the hour to hour variability in some of these um, commercial and residential buildings. And then we used the actual building geometry and parcel information itself to understand how these buildings are distributed and sized across the LA region. And so on the left hand side of your screen here, you can see the detail that we were able to capture when it came to residential, commercial and industrial um, parcels within Los Angeles. And so this is just a sneak peek on the right side of your 
um, screen of our initial results, you can see that this is looking at downtown Los Angeles to give you um, some context, you know, where you're seeing the commercial, for example, the heart of that red is in downtown Los Angeles and residential. Um, you can see some of the K-Town region um, as well. You can see an industrial hotspot. And then in panel D, you see the aggregation of all of these different anthropogenic heat contributions themselves. And again, this anthropogenic heat is coming from running our ACs, running our appliances, heating our water, um, and those types of activities. So note that D has a slightly different um, axis in terms of the legend. We also have the diurnal variability here. So you can see on your left-hand side, I'm gonna step you through the commercial um, sector in the same spatial extent that I was telling you before, and you kind of see it light up as the um, day moves towards the early evening and then kind of um, goes down again. And then on the residential side, you see the same thing. Um, you see as the day goes on, the red gets a lot brighter as people are, you know, going about their day to day business. And then as people start to go to sleep, it goes down again. So we're able to capture that detail. The next part of the project looks at vehicle traffic, and this is really a function of vehicle miles traveled um, and fuel efficiency and also fleet composition. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna go pretty um, fast through these, but you can see as you would expect, the anthropogenic heat flux of our cars is really consistent um, with the, uh, the spatial patterns of our highways. So you see the highways really um, lit up in that red, as you would expect. This was very, very difficult, as you can imagine, um, to get to the point where we have all of these data gridded hour by hour throughout Los Angeles. The third part is a less um, significant contribution, anthropogenic heat from our own metabolism. Um, so here we're looking at things like daily commute patterns, which vary both seasonally and diurnally to estimate the contribution that our bodies themselves, our population themselves contribute to this anthropogenic heat problem. Um, and you see a little sneak peek of our results here. The daytime metabolism is much higher than the nighttime metabolism on the scale that we're looking at. And then so what we're basically doing is we're aggregating all of these three contributors into one unique scale um, to get this total anthropogenic heat flux. And then we take these results and we run them through our weather research and forecasting model, which is basically um, a uh, meteorology model that was developed by the Bon Moise group to look at how climate um, how climate varies across the Los Angeles region. This is just a snapshot of our preliminary results. Um, this is more of a course representation that we're ultimately going to have, but our results are currently running. Um, but you can see this contribution of anthropogenic heat has the capacity um, to increase the heat across Los Angeles quite a bit by about a degree Celsius. Um, our real-time results will really be able or not a real time, but our more detailed res res results will give this at a much more detailed spatial scale. So you'll be able to see those hot spots. But even with our preliminary results, um, we have some indication of where these hot spots tend to be. So I'm about time so I can um, leave the policy and science significance of the study here. Um, but basically, you know, in terms of sustainability, we tend to think a lot more about the supply side of the equation, you know, converting our electricity um, systems to decarbonized systems. And I think this really underscores the importance of that demand side management issue. If we consume less energy within our vehicles and our buildings, we actually have the capacity to reduce this anthropogenic heat. Um, so with that, again, I just want to acknowledge again, Joseph Coe, who's worked so hard on this study, and then also, again, our friend and colleague, uh, George Ben Weiss. Kelly, thank you so much for that presentation. Um,
My name is Erin Coots. I'm the Executive Director of the LA Regional Collaborative for Climate Action and Sustainability, one of your co-hosts for today. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to get straight into questions with, uh, with Dr. Sanders. I'll be moderating the questions, so please enter your questions into the chat, um, and we'll take those um, after I ask a first question. Um, so Dr. Sanders, this summer, LARC partnered with the LA County Department of Public Health to produce a, an extreme heat Extreme Heat social media campaign. We had about 50 partners sign up to distribute materials through their channels, um, partners from cities and from local nonprofits. Um, and we are having, we have a plan to do another, another round next summer um, after we do some, some work with our, our local nonprofit partners to, to figure out what, what they think we should say next summer. Um, as our goal is ultimately to reduce heat-related illness, um, what should we take away from your research in terms of the impact of anthropogenic heat um, on vulnerable populations, marginalized communities across the region? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question, and I think really at the heart of this analysis. So when I think of anthropogenic heat, you know, I think just for the standpoint of people that might not be um, used to thinking about this concept, you can think about the landscape of Los Angeles, the urban form of Los Angeles, and, and take all the people out of it, take all the vehicles out of it, take all of the energy consuming appliances out of it. You still have solar radiation coming into that city and heating up a, those urban surfaces. So you still have urban the urban heat island effect. Now you put in all of the vehicles, all of the people, all of our air conditioners, et cetera, you start to get these positive feedback uh, effects. All of those heat pockets essentially get exacerbated. And so what that means for our vulnerable populations that tend to live in regions that are less green, um, they have less evapotranspiration from irrigation, for example, they live closer to highways, which tend to get a lot hotter, as you saw in the figures. Um, they live in you know, the middle of our urban centers. So our vulnerable, our most vulnerable populations tend to live in the hottest parts of the city. And so you start to ask yourself, you know, how can we start to cool those down? Um, our first line of defense is getting people better access to AC. And this is another part of my research portfolio right now, trying to understand who has access to AC and who doesn't. Now, AC does exacerbate that anthropogenic heat effect, but that's the best line of defense. Now, people have to be able to afford the AC themselves, which can come through policy initiatives, can come through. Uh, people also have to be, afford, be able to afford to run their ACs. So there's kind of two parts of that economic equation. Then you can start to think about reducing the anthropogenic heat footprint itself. We can do that through energy conservation, electrification. So electrified cars, electrified buildings tend to be more efficient um, than burning gasoline in cars or natural gas for water heating, et cetera. So that will bring down that anthropogenic heat load. You can start to think about things like cool roofs, which can actually reduce your AC loads. Um, and then kind of the third layer that I think about is if people don't have access to air conditioning, how can you get them to public cool space? So thinking about cooling spaces, um, public transportation to those cooling spaces, often it's the transportation itself that becomes the barrier. So I think there's a lot of different layers that we can think about, um, but I think this project kind of gives us a map of where we can um, prioritize some of those communities to reach out to. Perfect, that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, shifting from, from people to, to built infrastructure, the question from the chat that we have is Dr. Sanders said that the concrete absorbs heat more than grass, but asphalt streets absorb than grass, but asphalt and asphalt streets, apologies. Um, and then they remit considerably more heat than concrete. When Dr. Sanders mentioned concrete, was, it, was that a placeholder for all pavement? Um, or is concrete significantly more problematic than asphalt? So thank you for the question. I was, I was speaking a little bit too low, uh, loosely. So asphalt is a major contributor to the urban heat island effect. So I wasn't trying to say that concrete was the worst of everything. Um, but the point is, is that different sources have different capacities to absorb heat and they have different impacts on um, how the urban form traps that heat. 
but thank you for the clarification. Continuing in that vein of built environment, let's talk about um, introducing a greater volume of plants. A question from, from the chat is, would it greatly um, reduce the prevalence of heat, especially when, when trees are used? Yeah, so it's pretty commonly accepted that more green space means cooler spaces for some of the reasons that we just talked about, reducing some of that urban heat island effect. Um, trees and green spaces also increase evapotranspiration um, which has a cooling effect. It's kind of like an evaporative cooling effect. Um, and when you don't have those trees and you don't have those green spaces, you tend to have more hot spots. Um, so definitely greening is an effective way to get your cities cooler. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, a lot of times when we think about our policies, there's these unintended consequences. You know, right now we're gonna talk um, a little bit later about water conservation strategies. Um, as we reduce irrigation, we're actually reducing some of the evapotranspiration that would otherwise um, occur. So as the, um, the water evaporates off of the plants, it actually removes heat from the city. So as we reduce that irrigation, we're actually, we could actually have this unintended consequence of heat. So those are some of the themes that I'd really like to explore in future research to understand, you know, at surface value, yes, greening, um, spaces has these um, climate benefits, but then some of our other policies might also have some of these um, unintended consequences. So I'm kind of under interested in understanding the summation of those. Thanks, Kelly. Um, another question in the chat is, do heat pumps produce less waste heat than conventional air conditioning units? Yes. So. Um, as we go to heat pumps, heat pumps are a really exciting um, opportunity for us to markedly decrease the energy consumption of our buildings. Um, so they have a much higher efficiency than even normal electric water heaters and a much higher efficiency at the point of use than our natural gas heaters. So as we move to those electric heat pumps, we will get very, very significant um, energy efficiency benefits, which will then reduce our anthropogenic heat load. Um, and the bill that just passed um, in the United States, the IRA, the, the Inflation Reduction Act has a lot of um, really great incentives for, for interventions like that. I can do one last question is, um, apologies if we missed it, but what's the scale that the analysis was done at? So spatially, our anthropogenic heat um, uh, data set is 100 by 100 meters um, grid cells. And so very, very high resolution. And then the temporal resolution is hourly, but what we effectively did was we created a 24 hour profile for each month. So 12 hourly profiles for each month, 24 hour profiles for each month. And we did it for both a weekday and a weekend. So we, that we were capturing um, that behavior usage. And that just makes it a little bit more reasonable for us to run this um, meteorology model, which takes quite a bit of um, computational resources. Wonderful. Kelly, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm gonna to pass things back over to Cassie to introduce our next speaker. All right, thank you, Erin, and thank you, Kelly. Uh, super interesting and um, just demonstrating how UCLA and USC can work together, huh? <laughs> um, so next, next up today is Dr. Alex Hall. He's a professor at UCLA in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, where he is also the director of the Center for Climate Science. His research is focused on reducing climate change uncertainty at both regional and global scales. At the regional scale, he has been active in the development of downscaling techniques to understand climate change at the scales most relevant to people and ecosystems. Dr. Hall and his team use these techniques to create neighborhood scale projections of future climate, especially as it relates to future extreme precipitation and fire in California. Today, <clears throat> excuse me, today Dr. Hall will talk about his team's research on the potential impacts of climate change on Los Angeles's water supply from the Eastern Sierra Nevada to assist LADWP in its water planning process. 
handing it off to you now, Alex. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Cassie. And I also wanted to thank Kelly for mentioning um, Dr. George Ben Weiss, who was a, a friend and colleague of mine as well. And um, he's he's greatly missed. It really is a, a major loss. And I noticed Jonathan Parfrey mentioned that in the comments as well. So, um, yeah, so I um, wanted to talk to you all today about um, some ongoing work that we're doing um, with LAWP to try to understand the impact of climate change <clears throat> on the LA aqueduct system, and hopefully, hopefully also <clears throat> um, try to help LAWP um, plan for the future in terms of infrastructure investments that it might make um, to adapt to a changing climate. And this is work that um, has been led by Naomi Goldenson, who's a researcher at UCLA, um, and, and Ben Bass, a hydrologist, Eli Dennis, a postdoc, and Stefan uh, Rahimi, who is a, um, a climate modeler. Um, and um, I can just um, launch into this here. So um, this follows on some work that we um, did before to look at impacts of um, climate change on water resources in the, in the Sierra Nevada, which is, of course, where um, the LA aqueduct is, is draining water from. Um, and we identified a number of impacts of, of um, warming um, and, and quantified those. Um, and they are related to things like um, um, losses of snow due to a reduction in, um, in, in, in precipitation um, in in, um, in snow precipitation and an increase in rain precipitation, um, um, an increase in snow melt, an overall change in the snowpack, um, changes in the patterns of snow um, as, they, as they fall. So in particular changes in um, the elevational patterns of, of snowfall and snow melt, um, and um, also increases in um, evapotranspiration. So increases in, in water loss um, from the surface due to, um, due to warming. Um, so these are some of the effects that, that um, we highlighted and we, we quantified those um, in prior work. And the task um, that we have been engaging in with LWP is to try to make these much more precise for the, um, for the Owens Valley, um, which as all of you probably know is the, is the, is the watershed that um, is is, um, is where the LA aqueduct is located. Um, so on the right-hand side, you can see um, this is um, a, a map of the Owens Valley. Um, and I'll talk more about this modeling grid that, that we had developed in a second. Um, but the overall goal of this um, project is to use the latest climate change simulations, um, which are known as the CNIP-6 simulations. Um, these are produced in association with the sixth IPCC assessment report. And we have been downscaling those simulations um, pretty intensively. Um, and um, the idea is to um, really zero in on, on extreme events, um, the, ty the types of things that really stress um, infrastructure and human systems and, and also natural systems. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and then we are also we also are doing simulations of the historical climate um, with the same modeling framework. So we're trying to really um, reproduce what actually happened over the past seventy years or so. And the reason why that's really important is because we want to do calibration of our hydrologic models um, with LWP's um, gauge data. So we want to make sure that the hydrologic models that we're using to produce stream flow estimates from these climate simulations have been properly calibrated with the gauge data that's used by LWP. So it's a very, um, you know, very, um, you know, kind of um, specific approach that's very, um, very much tailored to LWP needs. Um, and then um, the final element of this is to um, produce what we call storylines, which are really just scenarios of um, extreme conditions. So extreme wet conditions um, and extreme dry conditions or drought um, types of extreme events that might stress the system. And the idea is to understand what the impacts might be or how, how um, LWP might respond. All right, so just a, a few words about um, the downscaling that we've been doing. Um, this is um, work that we've been doing over the past maybe two years or so 
Um, and as with all downscaling exercises, it starts with global climate models, and that's um, illustrated in cartoon form here on the left. Um, we have um, downscaled so far um, roughly um, about a little bit less than a dozen climate models. Um, and we've been analyzing these climate models to ensure that they are high quality for um, the region of interest, which in this case is, is California. Um, and in the middle panel here, you can see the, um, the grid framework that we're using um, to downscale. So this is really focused on the Western US. Um, we have a nine kilometer resolution grid over the Western US. Um, and then over California, we have a three kilometer resolution grid. Um, and by the way, this is the data that will also be used to inform the um, next California climate assessment and will be um, included in CALADAPT as well. Um, so um, there's there's a, a resource there um, that's coming online fairly soon um, that will allow everybody to access access this data. Um, okay, and then on the right hand side, just an example of um, what you get from downscaling for variables that are, of course, very relevant for hydrology, such as a change in precipitation. So on the top is the global climate model projection by the end of the century of the change in precipitation during California's wet season. And on the bottom is what you get when you downscale that model. In other words, when you run a regional climate model um, and you impose the same conditions that occurred in the global model, but you allow for high, res high resolution regional climate dynamics to evolve and produce a regional simulation. So um, that's just an example of some of the data that we've been producing. And this ensemble has this ensemble of, of, of runs has really matured, as I mentioned, over the past year or so, really, and we now have a pretty robust data set to work with. Okay, so um, that is the, um, the downscaling. Um, and just to give you a sense of how the increased resolution relates to the geography in the region of interest here, which is the Owens Valley, um, on the left is the nine kilometer grid um, with the Owens Valley underneath it. And then there's the three kilometer grid, which we have over California. Um, so very much the Owens Valley is very much included in this three kilometer grid. And um, if you compare that with the watersheds and the, and the, and the sub basins that are um, feeding into the LA aqueduct, you can see that we are resolving these different um, sub basins quite well. And we know that we're doing reasonably well too, because when we actually calibrate the um, the streamflow the streamflow simulations in the historical period against the gauge data the LWP has produced, um, we are able to um, reproduce those streamflow variations with quite quite a high degree of accuracy. So, um, so we're pretty happy with this resolution and. Um, and its ability to capture the hydrology in this um, critical region for Los Angeles. Um, so just a little bit of a few words about what we've been doing with the historical period. So um, these different sub-basins, you know, they have their own behavior and microclimates. Um, and so it's really worth it to, to resolve um, these differences. And if you look at, um, I mentioned that we, we've been doing these historical simulations where we're trying to reproduce what actually happened over the last um, 70 years or so. Um, and if we just look at the, um, the warming that's taken place over that time period by just doing a simple difference of the climate over the last decade, roughly, um, um, differenced against the climate of the last 50, 50 years of the 20th century, um, we can see that there has already been pretty significant climate change. This is pretty significant warming, which is in general consistent with what we get from from global models when they're forced by the observed increase in greenhouse gases. So this is mostly an anthropogenic um, or um, warming signal, which um, has a different meaning from the one that um, Dr. Sanders was using. Um, in this case, I'm talking about the warming that results from the global increase in greenhouse gases. Um, and this warming has already driven changes in the runoff. Um, and uh, in, in the region. So, and this results from changes in precipitation, evaporation, um, and snow melt. These all, these all um, respond to temperature and produce um, changes in runoff. 
Um, and so, for example, I, I'm not showing this here, but we've um, seen a reduction in runoff early in the year for the recent period and a shift in timing um, during the summertime consistent with a warming climate. So, um, so these, are, um, these are changes that have already occurred. And one question that we have and we're trying to work with our partners at OWP to answer is to what extent um, these changes have resulted in reductions in deliveries um, to the um, to LA, um, and there there has been a somewhat of a decline in deliveries, um, even when you control for the amount of precipitation coming in. Um, part of that is due to the fact that LWP has been required to keep more water in the Owens Valley, but part of it may do, may be due to the climate change that we've seen already. So that's an example of some of the work that we're doing. And um, then I mentioned these storylines. These are events or sequences or scenarios. Um, that we are developing to test the LA aqueduct system. And the idea is to provide this data to the um, to people in LWP, like, like Paul Scantlin, who are um, experts in operating LASM, which is the LA aqueduct model. Um, and the idea here is to, to um, really stress test this system and to understand um, when we do have events that we believe will be more common in the future, what does that mean for the LA aqueduct system? Um, so a couple of um, cases that would, that would stress current operational capacities, um, a wet event, um, we've been told by our partners in OWP that if we have two big wet years in a row or two or more wet years in a row, um, that really um, poses significant challenges for the infrastructure, especially um, in the Owens Lake bed. Um, and, um, and so, we one one storyline or, or scenario that we want to explore is this idea that of increasing frequency of, of extreme wet events and especially sequential wet events. And then another extreme case is a dry sequence that's that exceeds um, the 2012-2015 drought, or um, the current drought is actually now on par with that that um, you know previous drought. So um, we could also frame this in terms of the current drought as well, and maybe even last an additional year or more. Um, and of course, it's unfolding in a much warmer environment, which means a much greater loss of um, water through evapotranspiration. And of course, you would be characterizing the likelihood of these events under different scenarios, um, such as a world where we have two degree warming or three degree warming, um, et cetera. So um, just, I just wanted to close by giving a little bit of a sample, a teaser. Um, this happens to be one of our simulations. And what I'm showing here is the um, precipitation that's averaged over the Owens, um, Owens Valley. And this is given as a percent of normal, um, where normal is defined during the historical period. And um, you can see that there's, over, this is looking into the future here, into, into the end of the 21st century, and you can see that there's a, an increasing tendency towards wet extremes. Um, and so we've selected, you know, one example of a, of a sequence of very wet years. Um, this happens to occur in 2058 to 2060 in the, in the simulation, but that's kind of an arbitrary date. Um, so the idea is to take these, these, um, water, these water years and impose them on, on LASM. Um, so here is the, here's a blow up of the precipitation during this particular time period. Um, the red is showing you the um, normal precipitation, what you expect from just historical conditions. Um, and if you look at the, um, the actual simulated precipitation in this future scenario, you can see really dramatic um, departures from the norm here. So, um, you know, we have a succession actually of three very, very wet years. Um, and the question is, you know, what does this mean for the LA aqueduct system? This kind of very extreme. Um, event. Um, and so we've been using our calibrated hydrologic model that I mentioned a moment ago to produce simulations of stream flow um, in the different subbasins of the Owens Valley. And, um, and that's what's being shown um, here on the right. So these are these, these six different subbasins. Um, and you can see they, you know, of course, also are producing um, these very large stream flow anomalies. Um, in, in succession with these back-to-back uh, -back, um, water years. Um, so this information can, can be provided to um, LASM, the LA Aqueduct Simulation Model, 
and we can use that to um, to um, try to understand how how this would actually be handled by the LA Aqueduct system. And we can also envision um, that you know I think the drought scenario, of course, is going to be really relevant as well. Um, if we have four or five years of of, of drought with um, warmer temperatures than we've seen um, in the past, you know, what does that mean for water deliveries, and and what does that mean for LWP in terms of their need to um, purchase more expensive water from Met and, and so on. So these are the types of questions that we um, hope to get into. Um, and hopefully that gives everyone just a little bit of a flavor for what we've been up to. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I'm gonna get straight into questions. Um, we will hear more about groundwater storage in our next presentation. Um, but I'd like you to weigh in initially. Uh, what are the implications of these findings for LADWP infrastructure, especially planned investments such as ground, groundwater storage? Yeah. Um, so yeah, one thing that we have been um, hoping to do is um, work with LADWP to produce like an alternate version of LASM that includes um, groundwater storage facilities that might be in the Owens Valley that, that they are contemplating developing. Um, and the idea would be you take this really extreme um, future event that is probably gonna happen at some point and you stress test it um, with the new infrastructure um, and you can quantify you know, how much additional water would be captured um, and and you know you can you can make an economic calculation about how valuable that resource would be, and it would be a way to, and this kind of gets out of my wheelhouse a little bit, but um, there would at least be someone would be able to make an assessment of, um, you know, the 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 cost benefit analysis associated with 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 building that infrastructure. Um, so that's a that's a you know, the hope is that this could be a very direct way to evaluate. Um, how, how big these groundwater facilities need to be um, and, and how much money ideally would be spent um, to construct them. Interesting. A question from the chat. Is LADWP considering the introduction of water recapture by any and all sources and resources, including sources that might be toxic but can be neutralized? Is that a new wheelhouse? I'm, I might have to um, allow someone from OWP to answer that question if they um, happen to be on, on the on the in the Zoom or or interested in talking about it. Um, I'm not yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll do a quick intro. I, we do have water uh, staff available. I know Teresa, maybe you know, they can quickly unmute. But I'll, I'll do a quick intro. Is yes, you know, we we do have um, aquifers, particularly in Eastern San Fernando Valley, that have been uh, particularly uh, polluted from industrial. Uh, activities back in the day, and they're working on um, cleaning up the aquifer as well as building treatment facilities that will capture that, among many other things. Thanks for jumping in, Steve. Next question, Alex. Um, my understanding is that farmers are also locked into a system where they don't, if they don't use their allotment of water each year, they might not get it next year. Uh, if we had water markets, farmers could implement conservation methods and sell their excess water to cities without risking losing their allotment. Any any thoughts on water allocations? Um, you know, I, I I'm not a water economist. Um, <laughs> there there might be one in the room here, but you know, I I think in general, um, you with with the um, the anticipated stresses on the water system associated with climate change, any mechanisms that reduce the brittleness of the system are going to be beneficial. Um, and one of those, you know, you can add infrastructure. Um, you to, you can you can build in buffers. You know, that's that's what the infrastructure is. But you know, I think it's not hard to imagine that there might be economic levers too, and that that um, if there could be more flexibility in how water is traded. Um, and more transparency in, in, in how water is, is moved around, um, I think that would be beneficial. Um, so that my, I, can, I can comment on that from the climate change perspective, which is that we're moving into an era with more stresses. And so you wanna build in mechanisms to reduce, to increase flexibility. 
And that's just, the, and I think markets could do that. Um, we got a number of questions that I think are outside of the scope of your research. I want to bring it back to the implications of your, your research on LADWP's water supply and the water portfolio. You can speak a little bit more about water supply. Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by a message to me in the chat. What 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 is <laughs> <laughs> the, the perils of Zoom chat? Um, I'm interested in, in knowing a little bit more about the implications of your research on how LADWP thinks about its water supply and the portfolio of where its water is coming from. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the real world implications for that for DWP. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one, you know, one thing that I think um, we, I didn't talk about this too much, but I think one thing that would be interesting to try to quantify is um, the 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 not not just the impact on the extreme cases, but the net the net deliveries. Um, if you assume that the infrastructure stays the same, um, and you know, so one way you might imagine that we're losing um, we're losing net net deliveries is through this mechanism of of um, greater extremes, because if you have bigger wet, bigger extremes in the wet years, um, you know, there's not a lot of storage in that system. So its ability to bring water to LA um, is limited by the by the flow capacity of the of the system, and um, and so if you have um, more extremely wet years, you um, are going to have greater difficulty bringing all that water south, and there might you might have to leave some of that water. Um, in the Owens Valley. Um, so that's one way, even with um, more, more precipitation coming in in very wet years that you might have a loss of, of, um, of delivery. And then you combine that with the deepening in drought um, where you actually have less precipitation coming in in some years um, and, and, and deeper, deeper droughts or, or less water and, and even you know less deliver less less precipitation and therefore less delivery in some years um, I think you're looking at potentially a net a net loss and then you combine that with the warming which I think would require more water to be left behind either in in Mono Lake or in the Owens Lake bed um, or both you know I think you're looking at you know a, a net loss of water delivery by this system that would be my guess but you know, I think that's something that would be important to try to put numbers on. Alex, uh, thank you so much. Um, I see that there were a couple more chats, but uh, questions in the chat, but they are being answered. Um, so for the sake of the recording, I'll quickly read and, and respond with what we saw in the chat. Um, and then we'll pass things over to Greg um, or back to Cassie to, to introduce Greg. Um, so the question from the chat for the recording is that, um, Question, is LADWP considering covering the aqueducts with solar panels to protect water? You talked about evapotranspiration. Um, and in the chat, we the answer was that the aqueducts are closed. It's the state water project that has the open canal. Um, so thank you so much, um, Alex, for joining us today. Great, great to be here. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Aaron. Um, next up, we have Dr. Greg Pierce and Nicholas Chow. Um, Dr. Greg Pierce is the co-director of the UCLA Luskin Center for Innovation and the director of the Human Right to Water Solutions Lab within the center. He is also the co-director of the UCLA Water Resources Group within the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability and serves as an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Urban Planning. Dr. Pierce's research examines how infrastructure planning and policy efforts either perpetuate or address service inequities and demonstrates how communities strategically cope with and overcome inequities. His primary focus is on water insecurity, but he also examines solutions to cross-cutting green infrastructure, climate resilience, and transport insecurities. Dr. Pierce will be co-presenting with Nicholas Chow. Nicholas is a researcher at the Luskin Center for Innovation at UCLA and also a PhD student at Oxford University. He's a water engineering and policy expert on global infrastructure resilience to climate hazards. While encompassing other infrastructure sectors like energy, transport, and communication, his work at the University of Oxford focuses on water system strategy, governance, policy, and regulation. Today, Dr. Pierce and Nicholas Chow will talk about their research on the benefits to ratepayers associated with recycling all of LA's wastewater that it manages at the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant by the year 2035. 
handing it over to you, Greg and Nicholas. Thanks, Cassie. And I'll go ahead and jump right in. Again, I'm going to be setting the stage um, and passing it off pretty quickly to my colleague, Nick who, along with J.R. DeShazo, has been doing the heavy lifting on this project. Uh, the project we're working on in partnership with LADWP at the Luskin Center is called Value and Resiliency Benefits of the Hyperion Reuse and Groundwater Development Program, uh, otherwise known, and I think more easily known as Operation Next. And this is really looking at um, the relative value, economic value of LADWP's biggest investment in, in water recycling, um, taking into account uh, both climate and seismic risks to other imported water sources, which it currently relies on. Next slide, Nick. So again, I'm just gonna be setting up the stage essentially on the water supply situation and the hazards we're looking at, and then Nick will dive into the modeling methods and outcomes. Next slide. I don't think I need to belabor the point that climate is having an effect on uh, both California's water supplies and on LA City's water supplies in particular. Um, there's This is such a live space um, and there's a lot of moving parts, but essentially LA City is both um, uniquely privileged and uniquely exposed um, to risks because it relies on three imported water sources. Um, it has unique water imported water source, the LA Aqueduct that Alex just talked about, as well as relying on water um, coming down from Northern California, the California Aqueduct, and via the Colorado River Aqueduct, which I'm sure you see headlines about every day. Next slide. Again, uh, and we're looking at uh, two different types of risk here, um, both sort of the acute drought risk. Um, affecting each of these three supplies, which are coming from quite different parts of the US West and or Southwest, as well as seismic risk. Um, so this is showing you sort of the larger watersheds from the three imported water supply sources. Next slide. And then we're also looking at um, three different scenarios around seismic risk, um, which could affect each of the three different imported water supply sources. We're looking both at a scenario um, that just looks at, at sort of the effects in uh, northern and northeastern California, as well as the effects on the Colorado River, and then the two combined. Next slide. And with this, I'm going to pass it over to Nick to get into the details um, around the relative supply sources and costs of sources looking forward. All right. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my apologies. I'm a little bit under the weather today, but I'm so glad to be here and glad to share this work with you. Um, what I'd like to do to get started is just to orient everyone on the, on the call right now to what kinds of things we're going to be talking about with this model. So as Greg mentioned, we're looking at the economic cost benefit, uh, the trade-offs between bringing on recycled water with Operation Next, as well as the different water supply options that we can potentially consider in the future of the city of Los Angeles. That includes things like purchasing more water from Metropolitan, purchasing less water, changing how much groundwater we pump, and so on and so forth. And so uh, what I'm gonna be presenting today is really a simplification. Uh, the model itself is very flexible. It can assess many different kinds of drought scenarios and earthquake scenarios, as well as different cost scenarios for, for water and different amounts of supplies. Uh, today, what I want to give us some insight on is really what it looks like our most promising option. One of the options where we have sort of collaboration between regional partners, we can look at what is the value of having Operation Next integrated into the larger Los Angeles County water context and the benefits that's going to provide. Uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at what does the future look like if we don't, we don't construct or we don't do, invest in recycled water? And what does the future look like if we do? Um, and we're going to be comparing those two different cost scenarios using graphs that look a little bit like this. So on our y-axis here, we have the volume of water that we're going to be looking at for the city across the time period 2020 to 2085, roughly until the end of the century. And on our x-axis is time. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is on the graph here, we're, we're looking at demand without conservation is our sort of first step. How much is the city going to demand if we're not doing conservation, if we sort of continue or if we, we move forward with an approach that doesn't prioritize conservation. And I want to point out that 
DWP, as well as many other actors in the region, are really pushing conservation. It's a really core part of their strategy, and we're grateful for that. Uh, we can see here that if we don't push conservation, we have demands that far outstrip these, um, these colored bars, which are our water supplies. On the other hand, if we do have conservation, we're looking at this solid black line, uh, we have several different conservation pathways that we can look, look at into the future, and the model can account for any and all of those. Um, but what I, want to share, what I want to share here is what this dark conservation line looks like compared to the colored bars. And the colored bars, again, are our water supplies, and I'll talk about those in a second. But what it looks like is that if even if we engage in conservation, if we have population growth that's projected for the city of Los Angeles, towards 2070, 2075, we're going to reach into an area of demand that outstrips the existing supplies currently. And that's really important for us to consider because it might mean we have to improve our conservation and improve our conservation methods and approaches. And the folks at DWP are really pushing towards that. But right now, with our current projections, we're looking like we might need water in the future. So what kinds of water supplies does our model mainly consider? On most of the graphs, we're going to look at this, where we have these blue areas, uh, these blue bars that represent metropolitan water. This is water that's going to be supplied from the state water project and the Colorado River has been provided by Metropolitan, so purchased. Um, the model does consider the different kinds of cost differentiations that exist within Metropolitan water. Um, following that, we also have mainly the LA Aqueduct water. That's the water coming from the Owens Valley that um, Alex spoke about, and so we're grateful for that as well. And lastly, at the bottom, we have this foundation of groundwater. That's groundwater that's available to the city of Los Angeles. And right now, that's, that's looking all steady over time. One of the key assumptions that we make in this first the preliminary results is that these supplies are roughly fixed. We know that's not going to be true, but on average across many years, uh, that is what we've assumed here. We are an important, it's really important to emphasize this, uh, myself as well as uh, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, LDWP, are working on updating these numbers, updating our cost estimates. These are not our final numbers. And we're even working in collaboration with Alex Hall and his team on getting more climate variable estimates on what these water supplies might look like. So more on that later. Uh, what I've shown you here at first is what we have for the entire uh, system without Operation Next. And now I'm showing a uh, graph showing how much water would become available with Operation Next. And so we're seeing that with Operation Next, certainly until 2085, we would have more water supplies, enough water supplies to meet the demand with conservation. That doesn't mean we don't conserve, but it does mean that Operation Next can provide a valuable opportunity for water for us. It doesn't have to be a lot of water, but there is a lot of water available through this through the strategy, and so we're excited about that opportunity. Now, how do we evaluate this? As I mentioned before, we're going to be looking at what is the value of resilience? What is the value of having Operation Next online and providing recycled water versus not having recycled water? Well, we can see across this time period, if we don't have any droughts, so if we don't have any earthquakes, we are probably looking at um, facing more challenges close to 2070, 2075. However, what we're actually trying to evaluate in this project is we know droughts are coming. Droughts have been more frequent uh, within, within the past two decades, certainly. And we want to evaluate what is the value of Operation Next in facing some of these droughts. And so for a preliminary study, we took a representative scenario here where we're looking at drought, drought one, drought two, and an earthquake, a major earthquake, uh, in, which is in line with what folks, many folks in the region call the shakeout earthquake. And... What we're going to be doing here is we're going to be looking at this, these water supply deficits, these empty areas below the black line, and filling that with different water supply alternatives. So at its base level, I've shown you where we're going to see um, water shortfalls. What the model then does, it looks at what are the available supplies that are, that are within the region that could provide during these different events, droughts and earthquakes. And we're, we're talking about things here like Castaic Lake, um, reservoirs that are already within the city, um, many, many different supply options. What I want to point out here is the amount of red water that we're going to need here. The red water, where I'm going to refer to as emergency water, and that water is going to come at quite a high cost to us. Uh, it's going to be a stark difference compared to, if we look at these graphs, with Operation Next. So with Operation Next, we're seeing, firstly, that the deficits, the water supply deficits are much lower. Uh, so the requirements to meet those are going to be much, much less. And in particular, when we are looking at the different strategies that we can take in this bottom right-hand graph, we're taking a very collaborative strategy within which DWP, as well as other regional actors, are working together to continue storing water in the groundwater, essentially 
uh, using Operation Next as one way to provide water supplies and storing water, improving the groundwater health of LA's uh, basins, and maybe being able to extract that water at a later time. So that green water, those green areas in the graph that I'm showing on the bottom right, uh, that water is actually stored groundwater. That's an opportunity that comes to us because of Operation Next. Uh, to wrap us up quite quickly here, eventually what we're doing here with all those different supplies is we have a cost for each of those supplies. We understand how those costs change over time and how they discount over time. And so what we're doing is we're trying to evaluate a per unit benefit for Operation Next. And that looks like what is the cost of uh, the total cost of supplies over time with and without Operation Next and divide, it, divide that by the number of units of water uh, developed in Operation Next. And so this is a cash flow analysis that we're seeing here. And these cash flows are showing us what does it look like if we invest in, if we don't invest in recycled water and we see these red areas producing uh, large spikes in our cost and those red areas, again, are emergency water. The cost for emergency water right now is unknown. Are we gonna look at DWR costs? Are we gonna look at FEMA costs? Are we gonna look at uh, desal as an option here? Alternatively, we look at the, the cost analysis, the cash flow analysis for investing in Operation Next. And to be fair, Operation Next across this time period does have a very different cash flow profile. And that's because we have to invest upfront for our cash flow analysis. And again, just for our time for brevity here, I'm gonna pass it off to Greg, just to finish us off on our last slide here. Yeah, so right now we're finding uh, basically economic benefits um, under a number of different scenarios from Operation Next compared to alternative supplies. We are revising and updating, um, sort of extending the different scenarios we're looking at. Um, with respect both to climate as well as sort of different policy developments, which are happening every day. With that, I'll close and turn it back over to Aaron for questions. Exactly. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Nick. Um, I want to start with, um, we had some questions about um, the public opinion. So aside from the financial and the technical challenges to recycling all wastewater by 2035, the residents of Los Angeles have opposed water recharge projects in the past. Do you see your research having an impact on public opinion? Um, back. Do you want to take this, Nick, or do you want me to take a shot? Uh, sure, I, I can take it. Uh, I think from my perspective, public opinion on recycled water and groundwater recharge projects has been changing. It's been changing drastically in the last 10 years. And I think one of the one of the big challenges that we faced in sort of moving that discourse along is not having strong or reasonable economic estimates. Uh, there was, there's a lot of talk about the ick factor, um, about disinterest in, in recycled water, but we're seeing that many cities across uh, California are now, are now taking that up. And what we're working on here really closely with LDWP is our first approach of trying to quantify that value. And we think that having those numbers, whatever they turn out to be, whether they're positive or negative, Having those numbers is going to actually be, be able to have us move forward, uh, move forward in a way that is good for ratepayers. And that is, if it's a positive outcome, that I think we will have more support, more uh, quantified or sort of science-driven, science-driven results that will support recycled water. In the alternative, there's a possibility that, that these kinds of costs might not be positive. It's not looking like that from our preliminary results, and but we are updating these results and revising them. But in either case, we do think that this kind of work that's going to be able to provide economic estimates will help move forward the discourse and move, and shift public opinion. Can I add something? You want to add anything specifically on the toilet to tap question that we received? Or yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything Nick said. Um, opinion has changed. Uh, I think there's still more work to do on um, educating the public. Um, that this is safe, but also the technology is beyond safe at this point, and even direct potable reuse um, can and will be feasible. And, and I think, yeah. Uh, the other thing I do want to mention, though, is in a way, um, public opinions matters, but also everywhere in Southern California is making these investments at this point. Um, it's not just this plant for LA City, it's other investments LA City is making, it's Metropolitan Water District, it's LA Sanitation, it's Los Virginis, it's Pure Water in San Diego, similar projects in the Bay Area. We really don't have a choice at this point but to rely quite heavily on recycled water um, for our water supply needs. Thank you. 
Can I ask a question about the model that we received? It asked, does conservation reduce recycled water availability? Um, if so, how was that taken into account in the model? Yeah, I can take a shot at that. So that's a great question, I think. And it's, it's an important question. What the ASCA is referring to is that every year, if we conserve more, we use less water, which means there's less water available for um, essentially recycled water and recycled water consumption. The model does take into account that reduction. Uh, in fact, every year in the model uses the previous year's water demand to determine how much wastewater will be uh, provided. And then from that wastewater, how we also account for additional loss in the recycled water process. So that's usually through things like a reverse osmosis. So it does account for that. Thank you. A final question for you. I would um, also add that I mean, most of the cuts we're going to see for conservation in, in urban areas are outdoor and they're not going to affect recycled water supply as much, um, but it will be affected. Great. Final question for you is what are the policy implications of your findings that investing now in recycled water will avoid future costs for rate playing households and businesses? I can I can I can take a take a take a, a swing at that as well. Uh, I think that the the preliminary results of the model show very clearly that they're going to be positive uh, unit benefits or positive cost benefits to investing in recycled water. That's largely dependent on that red area of water that I, I showed earlier. That red area of water being the emergency water that we might use during droughts and droughts and earthquakes. And when one of the big challenges that we're facing in doing this analysis and why we're revising this is that red area of water in the graphics that I've shown you is assuming desal water, assuming the cost of desal. But in reality, we don't actually have that volume of desal water in the region to meet these needs. And so if we were to consider what might be reasonable alternatives to desal, we are looking at, um, and, and no one is making allusions that, we're, that this is what will happen in the end, but we're considering all the possibilities, including are hauled water or bottled water, and those costs are tremendously uh, much higher. Just for, for a point of reference, desal water is looking, looking at a cost of about $3,000 an acre foot. And when we look at bottle or haul water prices, we're looking at 300,000. So hundreds, orders of magnitude larger. In those cases, which are potentially more likely than desal to provide that water supply, in those cases, the cost benefit analysis that we've done is underestimating what will be a very large economic benefit. That's really interesting. Thank you both uh, for your time and for being here, for sharing your, your work with us. Um, sure. With that, I'll pass things back to Cassie. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Greg and Nicholas. So we're moving on to our last presentation for today. Um, we have with us Dr. Yusuf Bozardnia. He is a professor at both the UCLA Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Garrick Institute for the Risk Sciences. Dr. Bozorgnia's expertise includes earthquake engineering and ground motion hazard, with emphasis on multidisciplinary aspects of earthquake science and engineering. Today, Dr. Bozorgnia will talk about his research on the seismic risk of LEDWP's distrib distri distributed water infrastructure, such as water tunnels that cross active earthquake faults. Thank you, Yusa. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about seismic risk analysis of water transmission pipelines crossing earthquake faults. I would like to appreciate um, uh, my postdoc, Yu Peng, and also Alex is a research scientist at UCLA, as well as Doug Honegger, who is a practicing uh, professional. Uh, I would like to acknowledge, obviously, UCLA Sustainable LA, LA Grand Challenge, LA Department of Water and Power, also Texas Advanced Supercomputer Center uh, tremendously supported us. They gave us 10,000 notes, computer notes. Otherwise, we couldn't uh, do it without them, free of charge. Also, co sponsor partial uh, support from California High Speed Rail and California Energy Commission. You may ask what's the relationship. I will explain, explain in a um, minute. So there are many uh, water transmission pipelines crossing earthquake faults, uh, especially in California. 
This is the one example in San Fernando Valley is the LA Department of Water and Power um, major transmission water pipelines. And it crosses five different earthquake faults. So naturally you see the issue is serious, especially in California. So our goals uh, are to quantify probabilistically, naturally uh, fault displacement hazard and carry on uh, to carry out uh, seismic risk analysis of water transmission pipelines crossing earthquake faults. Therefore, my short presentation has two parts, fault displacement hazard and then seismic risk analysis of pipeline. Fault displacement hazard. So, this figure right hand side, as you see, is a 2019 Ridge Crest earthquake, two hours north uh, east of UCLA. Uh, it shows unbelievably um, uh, uh, serious fault rupture. And uh, just to give you a few seconds of background, fault rupture is different than liquefaction, landslide or cracking of the surface due to shaking. It's a major rupture of the earth crust and uh, not all earthquakes uh, have uh, fault rupture. Uh, and it's not only a couple of hundred meters, it goes miles after miles. Now imagine you have a water transmission pipeline or any other distributed facilities crossing faults then the consequence uh, can be serious. For that reason, fault displacement hazard modeling is of interest for all distributed lifelines. Obviously for water transmission system, LA Department of Water and Power is interested. California High Speed Rail, 800 miles of alignment uh, from Sacramento all the way to San Diego. It crosses more than 30 times uh, faults and also natural gas pipelines. They cross uh, faults num numerously. That's why we have co-sponsors for this part of the uh, project. So the motivation of uh, our fault displacement model is that the current models are based on only 17 earthquakes, 17 data points, and therefore uncertainty of the models is very high. So our goal of this part of the project is to develop a more comprehensive fault displacement database, empirical data, and then develop new fault uh, displacement models to predict or to estimate the amount of displacement. Uh, the database is complete. We have now 66 earthquakes by factor of three more data than previously mm, the community had magnitude five to magnitude eight. Most of the database is naturally a strike asleep, which is a very common type of earthquake faults in California. The predictive uh, models basically, or uh, they estimate uh, given the magnitude of, earth, of the earthquake and location of the pipeline across uh, along, the, uh, along the fault, the amount of displacement. And it's uncertainty. Uncertainty is very important, obviously, for our uh, profession. For example, this is one model. This is the model that UCLA has developed and completed. Left-hand side shows the fault displacement, how it scales with magnitude. Obviously, by increasing the magnitude, fault displacement is increases, but it's not linear. And right-hand side shows the fault displacement along the fault uh, line. So naturally, at the beginning of the fault, the displacement is very small or theoretically zero. End of the fault displacement should be very small or theoretically zero. The maximum displacement is somewhere in between. And generally, it's not in the middle of the fault. It's, uh, it's not symmetric. But we have a model including all the uncertainties uh, related to the models. So. Uh, the, 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 uh, the status of the fault displacement is that the database is already complete, the report already published, predictive models already completed, and 
and the reports are being published at the natural UCLA Natural Hazard Risk and Resiliency Research Center. The right-hand figure that you see is the latest model that the UCLA team developed. So the first part of the project is more generic and is co-funded also by other utilities, by other lifelines organizations. Now we go to the specific of water um, pipelines. The input data that we are using for analysis of water pipelines, these are all transmission pipelines, not distribution to your home. That's a separate issue. We are talking about large diameter pipelines that they are transmitting mainly water, especially to Southern California. That obviously is extremely important issue. So the pipeline characteristics, we'll get it from LA Department of Water and Power. The fault characteristics, we are uh, using local uh, geology maps and data with the help of geologists. And the whole idea is that we do a realistic world, um, real world uh, analysis rather than abstract. We like to do something that is impactful. So we have started with a relatively simple model. And then step by step, we made it more complicated and more complicated. So we started with the uh, pipeline. Obviously, these pipelines are embedded in soil, different depth of the soil on top of the pipelines. Uh, we started with the pipeline with soil springs, nonlinear soil springs and um, crossing fault. Then we moved on to more complicated three-dimensional soil and three-dimensional um, uh, fault crossing the pipelines. Then we added other features. So this is what I, I was uh, talking about. From simple model, relatively simple model, we moved to very complicated model. Then we added casing and grout. That is what we have, LA Department of Water and Power has especially in San Fernando Valley, which is the pipeline, then grout around it, and then there is a casing um, around it. Uh, and then um, uh, we ran many, many thousands of cases on supercomputing in the, um, at the University of Texas at um, uh, Austin. And then we subjected the models, complicated models, to various uh, fault, uh, fault movements. We changed the style of faulting. A strike a slip obviously is more uh, common in California, but we have reverse faulting. We have normal faulting with different deep angle of the fault and the amount of the displacement. So the combination is going to thousands of uh, cases. And then we register obviously stresses and a strain along the uh, pipeline in this uh, specific example, for example, if we have two feet of fault displacement for that uh, case of uh, fault, we get about to say uh, two, three percent of the strain in the pipeline, which is uh, not a small, but obviously larger displacement, uh, you get larger stresses and stress strain in the uh, pipeline. So the status of our project is that we have uh, done many, many numerous analysis completed. Now the issue that we have that we are gonna address it in the next few months is to merge fault displacement hazard, probabilistic fault displacement hazard uh, project first phase that I mentioned to you with the pipeline uh, analysis to develop fragility functions. Fragility functions basically uh, are probability of the uh, pipeline failure versus the amount of displacement. That we are gonna do it in the next uh, few months. So basically now we are in the phase of uh, merging two large pieces of the project to wrap up the project in the next few months. And as I mentioned, we will be done in the next few months but to develop fragility function. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any question, I'll try to answer. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. We did get a few questions. I'm gonna start sharing those from the chat. Um, actually the first. Um, 
sort of thinking about UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge and LARC's role, um, we both have worked to serve as bridges between academia and climate practitioners in the past. So we're interested in how collaborations are formed and I'd love to know more about your technical collaboration with LADWP. We have, uh, that's a very good question. We have had uh, extremely fruitful uh, interactions with LA Department of Water and Power. We have frequent uh, meetings, not with one individual, with several individuals. And the reason is very simple. We are not interested in uh, doing an abstract work and publish a paper that possibly no one is gonna read. We really are interested in doing impactful world, work, and that's why we need input from them. We are doing such and such analysis. Uh, is it uh, real? And they said, oh yeah, what about the, uh, the depth of the soil? You are taking it large, you are taking it small, and then we adjust. And then the other uh, side from us to the Department of Water and Power, we will tell them what we see uh, really. For example, one issue uh, which was unknown, do we get a, a huge stresses or a strain in pipeline, major transmission pipelines, not crossing faults due to ground shaking. And we did unbelievably uh, uh, sophisticated analysis and we don't see it. So we are telling the utility that don't worry about that case, but the other case which crossing fault is a major issue. So it's both into uh, two way, uh, a street and we are really enjoying it and it results in more um, realistic uh, finding. Thank you. Uh, based on your research, are you able to estimate the potential cost savings to LADWP for mitigation efforts? Design? Not, okay. That is very good point. Not yet. And again, is that we are going to tell them what cases they should be careful what cases are really detrimental, what cases they should not worry about it. And then the next phase is with the LA Department of Water and Power to do cost benefit analysis and priority, which pipelines they have to upgrade with which pipelines they should not worry about it uh, and so on. Not yet, but uh, it will happen hopefully in near future. Great. I'm seeing two comments in the chat um, that from Alex Hall says, um, this is just a comment, would like to, it would be good to examine the compound risks associated with earthquakes and climate extremes. Um, is that something that you're thinking about in the future? Obviously we are thinking about it and it's uh, complicated for various reasons. One of the uh, very obvious reason, and in fact, for another utility that we got research funding is that in uh, uh, Central Valley in California, because of the various climate change and water um, uh, deep uh, wells, we get the soil subsidence. And it's huge, it's not just uh, inches, there are feet of soil subsidence. Soil is settling down the, uh, year after year. We are doing an analysis to see these pipelines that are embedded in soil, they go with the soil down and they are stressed due to this settlement and we don't have earthquake yet. So we are hoping, and we, we resolve that issue, no earthquake, but settlement only. And we are predicting say in the next say 30 years, if it goes down with this almost same rate, they get rupture of the pipelines. Now we are thinking to apply earthquake on top of these things, for example. So it's basically uh, soil subsidence, then you get an earthquake, what will happen? We haven't done that, but definitely uh, we are thinking to do it. That's one example. Are you also looking at the human, the human impacts of um, sort of where the soil subsidence is happening and what populations live there? Again, not uh, now, but I, uh, we have another proposal that suppose we have all these analysis, first of all, we expanded not only to San Fernando Valley, but other uh, parts of Southern California, uh, and also uh, probability of the rupture of a major, say, water transmission pipeline or water tunnel pipelines. I have a proposal to uh, 
quantify the impact to various communities, especially underrepresented uh, community. We are thinking to do it. We have a plan to do it like anything else. Uh, hopefully we get funding to do it. I hope so too. Uh, Dr. Benzorgia, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I wanna to pass things back off to Cassie to close out so we can get everyone out of here on time today. Thank, thank you, you all thank for being you. here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bazornia. Um, before folks jump off, we do have a poll that will be popping up here. It's short and we'd love for you to complete the poll before you leave today. Um, I wanna thank you so much for attending today's research symposium. I wanna thank LARC and LADWP for partnering on this event and DWP for partnering with the UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge on these and other co-developed research projects. The Sustainable LA Grand Challenge is an interdisciplinary university-wide initiative aimed at applying UCLA research, expertise, and education to help transform Los Angeles into the world's most sustainable megacity by 2050. We've been doing this here at UCLA for about nine years. Um, our goal is to make it the most livable, equitable, resilient, clean, and healthy megacity and an example for the world. And the success of our program, of course, depends on partnerships with folks like you. So please do not hesitate to reach out with questions or partnership ideas at sustainablela at ucla.edu. Before you go, again, we ask you please complete that survey and uh, thank you and have a great day. <laughs>